So first, let's go through and review the different types of quadrilaterals. And some of the definitions may be slightly different from what you've learned before because we're kind of minimizing it. If you only have this, that's enough to say it's this shape instead of all the things that you're necessarily used to. So I believe everybody's good with quadrilaterals or four-sided polygons. A trapezoid has exactly two parallel sides. And at the end of this lesson, we'll get to some properties of a trapezoid and formulas for a trapezoid. A parallelogram is a four-sided figure, so it's a quadrilateral. But now we need to have two sets of parallel sides. So those would have to be parallel left and right. Top and bottom would also have to be parallel. That's all you need for it to be a parallelogram. And momentarily, we'll talk about some of the other properties that have to be true in that. For a rectangle, you probably know that as a four-sided figure with four right angles. That's kind of how you tend to learn it in elementary school or preschool. But now we're going to say, if we know it's a parallelogram, all we have to know is that one angle is 90 degrees and then automatically the other three will also have to be, and we'll see that in a moment. A rhombus is a parallelogram, and you probably learned that as all four sides are the same length. But all we need to know is that it's a parallelogram and two consecutive sides are congruent. Because it's a parallelogram, then the parallelogram properties will mean that all four sides actually have to be that same measure. And finally, we have a square, and that is a parallelogram that is a rectangle and a rhombus. And then all of those other things will have to be true that you know about squares. All four sides are the same. All four angles are 90 degree angles, et cetera, et cetera. So let's move on to some of the properties. I am first going to do these on a picture, and then we'll switch to actually writing down our conclusions as we look at that in our formula list, or our, you know, as some properties of this particular figure. So if we are talking about a parallelogram, our definition was simply that both sets of opposite sides have to be parallel. So because these two are parallel, I could, look at this transversal, and that would then allow me to say that this angle and this angle need to be congruent, correct? Or I could look at this transversal, which would let me say that this angle and this one need to be congruent. And let's see, what else can I come up with on that? Um, if I then, what did I not mark up? Oh, then I could also look at the top and the bottom as parallel lines, which would let me say this angle and this one are congruent. And I could also say that, where does my other one go? That this angle and this one would have to be congruent. All of those are alternate interior angles, right? And then we also would have vertical angles here in the middle. Those two would have to be congruent and these two would have to be congruent. I'm having to invent symbols here. I've got so many things running around in there. And let's see, what do I want to look at next? If I looked at this top rectangle using this transversal and the bottom rectangle, Does that mean that I would have a reflexive side that they share? And do they both have an angle I've marked with two blue tick marks? And do they both have 
an angle that I have marked with four red tick marks. And they both have an angle that is the same because it's this green plus red in both. So the top and the bottom would have to be congruent triangles, which would mean these would be corresponding sides and would have to be congruent. And I could do the same thing if I did this other diagonal to get the top and bottom halves that way, and I would have these sides congruent. So one of the properties I have, and you don't need to copy this down now, we'll put it in the formula list, we have the opposite sides have to be congruent. Everybody convinced of that much? Also, if I took the opposite angles, this one is blue plus red, and this one's blue plus red, those would have to be congruent, and the green plus red and the green plus red would have to be congruent. So the opposite angles are also congruent, and we'll put that in our formula list in a moment. And let's see, what else can I come up with now? Um, would you agree that now if you look at the four triangles inside, that we have a congruent side for the top and bottom here, these vertical angles, and then whatever I've got in there, let's see. So then if I looked, at, and then I would have, I think I marked something Oh, I, I used three and I used three and four for this with the same color. I, that was what was confusing me. Three and three, four and four, vertical and vertical, one congruent side. So that top smaller one and the bottom smaller one are congruent. So everybody, everybody's happy with that. So if those are congruent, that would mean this and this are corresponding sides, and this and this are corresponding sides, which means. This diagonal is cut in half where they cross. These two halves are congruent. Same for the other one. So the diagonals bisect each other. And the last one that I want to talk about, we really don't even need all of that stuff right now, so I'll erase part of that. If I just thought about the top and the bottom being parallel, or I could do the left and the right. Would you agree that where I'm putting this black dot right now is a corresponding angle to that one that I just also marked with a black dot? Would you agree that the one with a black dot plus where I'm drawing this blue, bar, blue mark right now have to be supplementary? So if we did a substitution instead of that black dot, use this black dot plus the blue one, would those have to be supplementary? So consecutive ones have to be supplementary angles. So let's get those properties in our formula list. I encourage that you write props or properties of a parallelogram and then just do an arrow to say, this is for all of these. And maybe put a little parallelogram symbol around the first number just to make it easier to spot when you're talking about in there. To summarize the things that we have just said, both pairs of opposite sides have to be congruent. Both pairs of opposite angles have to be congruent. The diagonals bisect each other, and consecutive angles are supplementary. Now, if you are using those as a reason, you need to say things like op sides congruent. We have so many letters and combinations of letters already for abbreviations. We're not going to start making more up. And we're not going to really use these for very many homework sets. So we'll write out enough of what we're using. We would also, we could say opposite angles congruent. We could say diags bisect, and that's not enough, bisect each other. And then we could say consecutive or adjacent angles are supplementary. So writing out enough of the letters that we can tell what words we are talking about as we go through these. Moving on now to rectangles. And our definition of a rectangle was a parallelogram with one right triangle 
So I'll come back to this page, but it's going to have everything that we've just said about parallelograms. We can use any of that and that we have one right angle. So here is my rectangle, and I know that I have one right angle in it. I also know because it is a parallelogram that opposite angles are congruent, so this other one down here has to also be 90 degrees. We also just talked about adjacent ones have to be supplementary, so this one up here plus this one down here have to add to be 180, and if the top one is 90, that means the bottom one is 90, and this then is an opposite angle to that, so we're going to have that all of the angles are 90 degree angles like you're used to thinking about ever since nursery school or elementary school or whatever uh, when you first started learning what a rectangle is. We also have that the opposite sides are congruent. We also have that the diagonals bisect each other. So let's need a different symbol there. So for example, I know that that much has to be true. And let's see, what else could I say in here? Why don't I take a look at this triangle and this triangle. Do both of them have a side with one tick mark? Do both of them side have a side with two tick marks? Do both of them have a congruent 90 degree angle in between the one and the two tick marks? So SAS, those are congruent. So the hypotenuse that I've marked three and three has to be congruent to the hypotenuse that I haven't marked yet. And it is also bisected. So these also have to be the same. So then three tick marks plus three tick marks equals three tick marks plus three tick marks. The diagonals have to be congruent. So that gets us these two extra properties for a rectangle that all angles are right angles and the diagonals are congruent. So if you're having to use that idea because you know it's a rectangle, you're going, you know, you could write all angles are right or something like that um, for your reason. Or you could write out that the diagonals are congruent. Next, we'll move on to a rhombus. And a rhombus has all the properties of a parallelogram. So everything we talked about, not necessarily with a rectangle, but everything for a parallelogram. And two consecutive sides have to be congruent. So if we know that two consecutive sides are congruent, what is true about the opposite sides in a parallelogram? Left and right have to be congruent. Top and bottom have to be congruent. So if it's a rhombus, all of the sides are going to have to be congruent. We also know that the diagonals bisect each other. Don't know that the diagonals are congruent. And in fact, on this rhombus, it looks to me like this one going top left to bottom right is going to be shorter than the other one. So I only know that the diagonals bisect each other. So I know that that much has to be true. I also know that opposite sides, um, or no, um, because of SSS, do you see four congruent little triangles inside there? Okay, that means that this angle that's across from one tick mark, this one across from one tick mark, this one across from one tick mark, and that one across from one tick mark must all be corresponding angles, so they have to all be the same, right? So if I decide one of them is X, the other three are also X, circle sum says that 4X has to equal how much? So 1X equals... 
If 4x equals 360, what's 1x? So these in the middle must all be right angles. The diagonals must be perpendicular to each other. So from what we've just said, that we saw four small congruent triangles, and now we know they're all right triangles, they are four congruent right triangles. In addition, we can say that, let's see, so across from two tick marks, I have this, and across from two tick marks, I have this. So those would have to be corresponding angles. So they would have to be congruent, which means that that diagonal bisected this angle. And I can do the same thing up here, and I can do the same thing with my other diagonal and get that the diagonals not only bisect each other, but they also bisect the angles. So that brings us to these properties, and I will need to slide down for the fifth one, but we start off that a rhombus is a parallelogram with two consecutive congruent sides. So it has all the properties of a parallelogram. That ends up meaning that all of the sides are congruent. It ends up meaning that the diagonals divide the rhombus into four congruent right triangles. Or maybe I should have said first the diagonals are perpendicular. The order really doesn't matter on the list here. And then the diagonals also bisect the angles. So we could say if we needed to use that all sides are congruent if we know it's a rhombus. We can say if we're doing something with triangles or needing that those are congruent triangles, diagonals form four congruent right triangles. We already had diagonals bisect each other because it's a parallelogram, but we can also say that the diagonals bisect the angles, or we could simply say on the last one diagonals and then use our perpendicular symbol that looks like an upside down uppercase T. And then we will move on to a square that's not going to have a whole lot of additional stuff in there. It'll be the shortest of them. So moving on then to the square, we said that a square is a rectangle and a rhombus, which means we can start off with our properties of a square, all the properties of a rectangle, and then all the properties of a rhombus. Surprise, surprise, if that was our definition there. Only one other one that we are going to have. So we have already said that we know these have to be right angles. We have already said that because it is a rectangle, the diagonals are congruent. And because it's a parallelogram, they bisect each other. So that means I can mark both of those sides like that. We know those are four congruent right triangles, right? And would you agree that not only are they four congruent right triangles, but they are also isosceles triangles? So that's the final property that we add in here that we just expand on what we had before and say that not only do we have four congruent right triangles, but now we can say if it's a square, those are isosceles right triangles. Again, now moving on if we want to go the other way. So far we've said if we know it's this kind of shape, then we have these properties. Now we're going to say if we have, how do we prove that it's a certain shape? If we have these properties, then we can conclude it's a square or it's a rhombus or whatever. We can always satisfy the definitions that we talked about first. We could say that it's got four sides. We know the opposite sides, both sets are parallel. Therefore, it is a parallelogram. That was definition. If we don't know anything about parallel sides, but we do know 
left and right are congruent, top and bottom are congruent, that's enough to say that it is a parallelogram. If we know one set of opposite sides are parallel, but we don't know about the other one, but we know that the parallel ones are congruent, that's enough to say that it's a parallelogram. If we don't know anything about the sides of the quadrilateral, if we don't know anything about um, parallel or how long those sides are, but we do know that the diagonals bisect each other. It's okay if one diagonal is longer than the other one, but if the two pieces of this one are congruent and the two pieces of the other one are congruent, that's enough to say that it is a parallelogram. Or if we know both sets of the opposite angles are congruent, that's enough to say that it is a parallelogram. So we could know both sets of opposite sides, or we could know both sets of opposite angles, and that would be enough to say congruency. Or, I'm sorry, it'd be enough to say parallelogram. If we have a four-sided shape and we want to prove that it is a rectangle, we could somehow or another know that it's a parallelogram. Maybe that's given. Maybe we figured it out from the things you've just written down. Um, and then you know that it has one 90-degree angle. Then you could say, therefore, it is a rectangle. Or if you know that it's a parallelogram from the things up above or definition or just given, and you know that the diagonals are just as long as each other, then it is a rectangle, or if you go back to the definition that you probably first learned when you were a little kid, that it's got four 90-degree angles, that is still enough to say, therefore, it's a rectangle. And the last group is, how can we prove that something is a rhombus? And we could go through our definition that it is a parallelogram and two adjacent sides or consecutive sides are congruent, then that would be enough to say that it is a rhombus. Or if we know it's a parallelogram and just one of the diagonals bisects the angles, then we can say that it's a rhombus. And finally, if we know it has four sides and we know that the diagonals form 90 degree angles and we know that the diagonals bisect each other, the diagonals don't have to be the total same length, but the two pieces of one are the same, the two pieces of the other one are the same, that will be enough to prove that it is a rhombus. Moving on to some of the kinds of things that the book is going to ask you. The diagonals of a certain parallelogram do not match. They're not the same length. Which ones could it be? It doesn't necessarily have to be, but which ones could it be? In a rectangle, can the two diagonals be different? So can't be that one. A square is a special rectangle, right? So if it can't be a rectangle, it can't be a square. And if you think about the diagonals of a square, they would have to be the same length. Well, hopefully it's not none of the above. Um, is it okay in a rhombus to have one diagonal that's longer than the other one? So even though the back of the book, I think just as a letter, I am going to ask you, write C rhombus. That's all you have to do. You don't have to show any work, but please do the letter and the word. Question? Okay, another one that's a similar kind of question. We'll do three of these and then we'll move on to trapezoids. The diagonals are not perpendicular. When did they have to be perpendicular again? Well, I'm not sure I'm remembering. Well, what if I draw an exaggerated rectangle? Do those look anywhere close to being perpendicular? Uh -uh. So we know it's not that one. Was it a rhombus where they had to be perpendicular? Or, a, or wait a minute, I'm sorry. I misread it, didn't I? Which, in which of them are they not perpendicular? 
they're not perpendicular in a rectangle, right? So yes, that one matches because of this word here. I was thinking are perpendicular. Sorry about that. In a rhombus, will they be perpendicular? In a square, will they be perpendicular? So only a rectangle works. So that is what you're going to write down. Kind of see how you're figuring these out? Okay, now we have a parallelogram. Let's see if I can read it correctly this time. The diagonals are both the same length. Which one must be true? There might be something in there that maybe it's true. Sometimes it's true. Sometimes it's not. But we want to get one that absolutely has to be true if the diagonals are the same. So start thinking about that. If the diagonals are the same, do all four sides have to be the same? If the diagonals are the same, do they have to be perpendicular to each other? If the diagonals are the same, does it have to have four right angles? What do you guys think? Give me a vote. Does A have to be true? Does B have to be true? What about C? I'm seeing a few hands go up, but a lot more kind of puzzled faces hesitant to answer. The diagonals are the same. Is it possible to draw something with diagonals the same, but the four sides different? I could draw that and the diagonals will be the same and the four sides won't all be the same, so it's not going to be A. Same one, because we just talked about that. If I draw one like this, are the diagonals perpendicular? They bisect each other, but they're not at 90 degrees, so it can't be that one. If the diagonals are the same length, does that mean that it has to be some kind of a rectangle with four right triangles? So this one, you would write C, and you'd say all four angles equal 90 degrees or something like that to write down the gist of what you were talking about for your answer. Okay, gave those fingers a break from all the writing. Let's move on to trapezoids, which isn't as bad. Um, you know that a trapezoid has one set of parallel sides and the other side would not be parallel because the definition on trapezoid was exactly one set of parallel sides. Most of the time we turn our papers so that those parallel sides are at the top and the bottom. The one that I drew on the definition page, it looked like the two sides left and right were the same length. Sometimes that's true, but not always. So I tried to draw this one where they looked like they were different lengths. I've also color coded this. What I wrote in black corresponds to the black lines. What I wrote in green corresponds to the green lines. New vocabulary, median for a trapezoid, connects the midpoints of the legs. So it's what I've drawn in blue. What that means is that those two pieces of the leg on the left have to be congruent to each other. These two pieces of the leg on the right have to be congruent to each other. And then you draw that line through the middle. Altitude or height is a word we've used quite a bit. Is perpendicular to both of the bases since they're parallel. And I can draw that anywhere I want to in the, tri in the trapezoid. I purposely did not draw it at any one of the four vertices, but I could have. But I just wanted to emphasize it doesn't have to be drawn at a at any one of the corners on that. Now, if the picture matches what I had on that first page of our notes, we call it an isosceles trapezoid. That is when the left and the right sides are congruent to each other when those two legs are congruent. 
that will mean that the two vertices that are adjacent to one of the parallel lines will be congruent and the two that are adjacent to the other parallel line will be congruent to each other. And depending on which way it's turned, you don't have to have the longest side on the bottom, you could have the longest side on the top. Um, sometimes it's easier to talk about upper and lower base angles, just if everybody's looking at a picture that's turned the same way, you can say, well, the base angle's up at the top, the base angle's down at the bottom. That's all that this is talking about so far. And we ought to review our formula for finding the area of the trapezoid. Who remembers how that works? You've known that for several years now. Chloe, thank you. Mm -hmm. Our formula for the area of a trapezoid is one half, parentheses, base one plus base two, remembering B1 and B2 are the parallel sides. I like to think of this as the average base times the height. Because regardless of whether I did B1 plus B2 over two, I'm adding the bases and dividing by two, that's the average of the two bases times the height. Or I could look at it over here, add the two bases and multiply by a half, that's still the average base, and then takes that, take that times the height. The two formulas are equivalent. Personally, if I have any fractions for either one of the bases, this one is 13 and a half or 27 halves, if I have fractions, I want to put them in this formula. I don't really like when I start putting fractions in here and I get a complex fraction. It's fine too, but I find it easier if I write it this way anytime I've got fractions. Just as a little tip. New formula. That median that we drew through the middle. It is the average base. It is just that other formula without the times height. The line through the middle is the average of the top and the bottom one. It's halfway between the top and the bottom one in the picture. It's halfway between the top and the bottom one in terms of how long it is. And so then just a couple of quick examples using these formulas just for review. Oh. Well, summarizing what we've just said so far, I already talked about those upper base angles are congruent, the lower base ones are congruent, um, the diagonals would end up being congruent as well, and just because of the parallel properties, just like we did with the parallelogram, um, any one of the upper base ones plus the lower base one would have to add up to 180 degrees. So if we have a trapezoid, so we're told that these are parallel, and we're told that the area is 175 square centimeters, can we figure out what X has to be? Well, let's just start with our formula. The area of a trapezoid is base one plus base two divided by two times the H. Okay, 175 goes in here on the left. Base one is X, base two is 2X plus eight, parentheses around all of that. Height is 10, that's divided by two. Next step, what do you do? Clear the fraction, Tristan. Multiply both sides by two, so let's, or actually let's do the 10 divided by two to make it a little bit easier. 10 divided by 2 is a 5. So 175 is 3x plus 8. Have you already finished it? Oh no, plus 40. I'm t or that was then times 5, sorry. So 15x plus 40. 
is 175. So 135 is 15x. What does that mean x has to be? Not 8. 9 will work. And then that would have to be centimeters since all of the other units are in centimeters. And last one, can you find x on this one? Can you use that formula for the median? Can we write down that the median must be the average of the two bases? So 2x plus 2 plus 7x minus 2, all divided by 2. And this is where my brain was going when I was saying multiply both sides by 2. 8x plus 2 would be 9x. So everybody shout out, what is x? Beautiful.